Um, welcome everyone to another one of our PSO educational webinars. Um, my name is Tony DeSantis. I serve on the Education Committee. And tonight we have Annie Lindsay presenting 60 Years and Counting, the Past, Present, and Future of Avian Research at Powder Mill. So Annie Lindsay is the Bird Banding Program Manager at Powder Mill Nature Reserve in Rector, Pennsylvania, which is a field station of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And she runs the long-term bird banding station and teaches banding workshops there. She earned her master's in natural resources at the Ohio State University, where she studied the effects of winter habitat quality as determined by stable carbon isotope analysis on plumage characteristics and reproductive success in yellow warblers. She is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Toledo, where she studies trends in long-term bird banding data sets and how anthropogenic factors, and particularly climate change, affect avian populations, movements, and behavior. Annie is a North American Birding Council certified bander trainer and serves in leadership roles for several bird-related organizations and societies. She's an avid birder, loves sharing a hobby with new birders, especially her son, Tommy. So Annie, if you are ready, first off, thank you for joining us tonight. And I will let you take it away from here. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And um, thank you all um, at PSO for inviting me. This is a really great opportunity. So yeah, I, um, I run the bird banding station here at Powder Mill um, Avian Research Center. And I thought it would be nice to share, you know, the, the 60 plus years of history that we have here and then what our plans for the future are. Okay, so um, Powder Mill Nature Reserve was established in 1956. Um, it currently, we have about 2,200 acres on our property. Um, it provides this natural forest, it's mostly a forested um, property. It's a study site that scientists either on site or from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History or even outside researchers come um, to study a different system. So we have um, really strong presence in ornithology, but we also have um, um, in the either past or present, we've had mammologists, we've had we have herpetologists, um, botanists, entomology, forest ecology. We have a GIS lab, we have a DNA lab. Um, we do a lot of education and outreach. There is a, a full-time education staff here. So they do public programs throughout the year and they do summer camp for kids. Um, so we are the environmental field research station of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, which is about 50 miles away in Pittsburgh. So the Powder Mill Avian Research Center, um, the, the, this name came about maybe 20-ish years ago, but the banning station was founded in 1961. Um, the purpose of this was to inventory and study the local bird life here, just in the general vicinity of Rector, Pennsylvania, which is teeny little town, but um, the greater Ligonier Valley or we're in Westmoreland County. Um, so the focus is monitoring and researching birds. Um, the banding program really is at the core of that though. So we have the distinction of being the longest um, running year round banding station in the country. So I think a lot of banding stations um, run maybe during the breeding season or during the migration season, but we go year round here. Um, so some things that we study are changes in phenology and behavior and morphology. Um, we study migration. There's a lot of behavioral research that goes on here. Um, we think about things like longevity and these songbirds that we catch. Um, we do population monitoring. We've done some disease work. Um, we look at habitat usage. Um, and that's, that's not everything. So we also have um, a flight tunnel on site where we test um, avian perception of glass. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot with uh, wildlife tracking. So we're um, really strongly involved with the MODIS Wildlife Tracking Network, and we have several projects that use that. So our purpose here really is the conservation of birds and their habitats. Um, you may, I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard the paper that came out a couple of years ago um, 
where they talked about how 3 billion birds were lost since 1970. So I think they were saying about a quarter of all birds are just, just gone now. Um, there are some species or groups of birds that have experienced greater losses and our research really does contribute to um, some real, real world conservation. So this is just an aside, um, Cornell and their partners came up with this seven simple actions to help birds. I'm sure most of you have seen this, but these are all really great suggestions. Um, you know, if you're concerned about bird, bird loss and, and population declines, these are some really simple things that can be done to help um, conserve birds. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so with the bird banding station at the core of what we do, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, the, the process that we do um, daily during migration, but a few times a week during the other seasons. So we run um, 63 to 67 mist nets during our migration seasons. And sometimes in the winter, we run traps or, or um, a reduced number of nets. And so the nets are strung up um, throughout the habitat. There are these net lanes cut. So the purpose here is that, or the idea is that nets become somewhat invisible when they're, especially in, in the shadow. So this photograph here was purposely taken on a sunny day where you can kind of see the nets. Um, they are 12 meters long, they're about eight feet tall. And so as the birds are flying through the habitat, um, they, they run into the net. I hate to say they hit the net because that sounds way more violent than what really happens, but they do hit the net and they drop into these pockets in the net. Um, and that's what holds them safe and, and steady until we go around and extract the birds from the net. So we generally, our protocol is that we open our nets half an hour before sunrise. Um, we check the nets every 40 minutes for six hours each day. So we um, put the birds in these little cloth bags and we bring them back to the banding lab and that's where they get their band. So um, every bird has a band that is engraved with a series of nine digits. Um, they're either aluminum or for some of the birds that have a stronger bite like cardinals, they'll get a stainless steel band. Okay, so then the next step is to figure out how old the birds are. And this is, um, there's several things that we can do to figure that out. And one of the things that we really specialize here, um, specialize in here at Powder Mill is um, looking at molt and molt limits and trying to figure out whether birds have juvenile feathers or a mix of juvenile and non-juvenile feathers or if they have all adult feathers. And that tells us um, whether the bird hatched within this calendar year or maybe the previous calendar year or at some point before that. And that tells us um, how old the birds are. We can also look at things like um, feather shape, um, feather wear, um, feather quality, we can look at, sometimes we can look at birds' eye, eye color. So the, the color of the iris can tell us how old the birds are um, or soft parts on the birds. And during the fall, we can actually um, part the feathers on birds' heads, see through their skin to their skull. And if we see one layer of skull, we know it's a younger bird. And if there's two layers of skull, um, we know that it's an older bird. And it's a process called pneumatization where young birds only have the one layer and over several weeks to months, they grow um, a second layer. And it is visible as um, one layer is kind of pinkish and two layers is white with these little white um, polka dots, which are these struts between the two layers of skull. Um, in the case of saw wet owls, um, this is the coolest thing there. You can use a black light to look at the different generations of feathers. So in this photograph here, and it's it's kind of an awkwardly taken photograph just because the photographer was hovering over the bander, but you can see it several different colors in that bird's wing. There's um, bright pink, which are the newest feathers. There's something, there are a few that are kind of like a dull purplish, light purplish color. Those are the middle generation. And the ones that are a little bit more chalky bluish white, those are the oldest feathers. So that tells us um, something about the bird's age. So this, whole aging process. For most of the birds we catch, we're very familiar with what we're looking for. It doesn't take much time. So the next step is trying to sex the birds. There are plenty of birds where the plumage is the same in males and females, and so we just don't know. But there are 
plenty of birds out there where the males and females do look quite different, um, either by plumage or size or something else. And then during the breeding season, we can look at um, the, what we call breeding conditions. So in females, um, they get what's called a brood patch. So they lose the feathers on their belly. It gets kind of wrinkly. Um, and that's that top right picture. That's what a brood patch looks like. It um, becomes vascularized and that's how they can transfer heat to their eggs during incubation. And the males get something called a cloacal protuberance. And I know that this is maybe a very awkward photograph um, and it's looking at the bird's cloaca, but what happens is it swells up and that aids in sperm transfer. And so by looking at these characteristics, we can assign the sex to birds that um, otherwise look the same. All right, so then the next step is taking a series of measurements. Um, typically, we just do a wing length and um, tarsus length here at Powder Mill, but there are other, other measurements we might take. So tail length, um, some beak measurements, um, maybe a few other things. Um, the next step is assessing fat. So we can, because we can see through bird's skin, we can part the feathers on their their breast area or their abdomen area, um, and we score how much fat the bird has on a scale of zero to seven. So in the Tennessee warbler on the top, that would be probably a score of six. So this is a bird that has a lot of fat. It's overflowing. This bird's ready to migrate. So the fat is what fuels these migratory flights. Okay, and then the last little bit is um, taking mass. So we have a special scale with this weighing cone that can fit almost every bird that we catch here from hummingbirds all the way up through pileated woodpecker size. Um, we've even been able to weigh, weigh a um, red-shouldered hawk in this scale. And then we release the bird. So these, this process um, of birds in the hand in the lab takes maybe 30 to 45 seconds unless there's something really interesting with the bird and we want to take more photographs or a closer look. Um, the birds are on their way and, and back out to doing whatever they were doing. Um, so at this point, um, as of, well, I don't, I haven't actually looked at the data as of today, but we're at about 820,000 banding records now. Um, and our data set has about 190 species in it. So some of these birds, like cat birds, there's tens of thousands of them. And there are other species where there's only one or two individuals. Um, we banned about 13 to 15,000 birds a year. That includes our recaptures as well. So um, we did start in 1961 um, and we run year round. So this during the spring and fall migration season, there's 60, about 65 nets and we ban six days a week. In the summer, we drop back to about 25 nets a day. We alternate which sections of nets we have open so that the breeding birds aren't being captured every single banding day because they have um, territories that are in our net lanes. Um, and we only band about three days a week in the summertime. Um, we do other projects in the summer, like we do point counts. Um, and it's, another, it's a, another opportunity to get caught up from the spring season and get ready for the fall season. And then in the winter, we run six nets or six traps. It just depends on what the weather's like. Um, had I been running the banding station today, I probably would have only run the traps because we had some wet snow today. Um, and that happens only two days a week in the winter. So the question is, you know, why, why band birds? Why do we do this? Um, I love this quote from 120 years ago um, because I think that we're still asking a lot of these same questions. Um, in particular, the, the question of the whole annual cycle. If we take one individual bird, what is it doing throughout its annual cycle? Where is it going? How long is it taking to get there? Um, what route does it take? How often does it stop? All of these questions, um, we know a lot more today than we did 120 years ago, but we are still learning a lot more and there is still a lot more to find out. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, a powder mill avian research center in the past. So um, Bob Leverman founded the, um, the banding lab in 1961. The first bird that he ever banded here was a female indigo bunting. So that was in June of 1961. He was here 
through through the 2000s. Um, even when he retired, he was still coming back to the banding lab to help out. And in his later years, he would just come and watch. So this is what the banding lab looked like for, for decades. Um, it was a cinder block building with a desk um, and banders sitting around it. And I think powder mill is somewhat unique in the way that we, the, 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 the process that we do once the birds are in the lab. So um, the birds are in bags. It used to be paper bags, now they're cloth bags. One person takes the birds out, puts a band on them, rebags them, and then hangs them on a pulley system, which is not pictured in any of these pictures, but I think will probably be in other pictures. And then um, the processor then pulls the birds back out of the bags and then does all the aging and sexing and measurements while somebody records the data for them. And now we have, we actually just directly enter um, our data into a computer rather than handwriting them on data sheets to enter them later. All right, so I thought I'd just talk about some of our um, milestones. So the first one was June 18th, 1961. The first bird banded was um, an adult female indigo bunting. This is what the data sheet looks like. That's the actual <laughs> 1961 data sheet. So the furthest recovery, you know, one of the coolest things about bird banding is um, these birds go somewhere. A lot of them migrate, they, they go somewhere. And if that band is encountered, we have a data point about where it went. Um, and so on September 24th, um, 1966, a Swainson's thrush was banded at Powder Mill and it was recovered in the winter of 1970. So what happened, and this was in Northern Peru. So somebody had blow darted the Swainson's thrush, saw the band and then put it on his necklace. And a missionary saw the band and somehow had the foresight to say, oh, I'm gonna report this back to the banding lab. So we know that we had a Swainson thrush fly all the way, all the way to um, northern Peru. The rarest bird that's ever been captured here, and that's um, that's a question we get a lot. So September twenty first, nineteen seventy one, Bob Leverman caught a Kirtland's warbler. So the reason that this is the rarest bird is because I'm sure you guys all know Kirtland's warblers. Um, there's not very many of them anyway, but in the 70s, their population was pretty much at an all-time low. There are only a few hundred of them left. So for us to catch one here was pretty remarkable. Um, I think we are well overdue for another one, and I hope that happens someday soon. Okay, so the 100,000th bird banded here was a Swainson's thrush. The 200,000th was a song sparrow. The 300,000th was a ruby crown kinglet, 400,000th was a chipping sparrow. So then that same year, um, a couple months later, this is 2001, the 500,000th banding record was caught. And so that banding record includes new birds and recaptures, and that was a gray cat bird. So you'll notice, and I find this really, I mean, I guess this is expected, but all of these milestone birds were, are very common species. Okay, so on October 6, 2006, this was the biggest day here at Powder Mill. They banded 890 birds that day. Um, something that's extra remarkable is um, most of the banding crew was in Mexico, Veracruz, Mexico, for a conference. Um, so Bob Leverman, who's in the red shirt on that picture, was here. Um, there were some field techs, and there were some visiting ringers from England, and they handled this massive day um, alone. And I think there were more than 250 kinglets. So it was a pretty wild day. So our biggest celebrity bird, this happened a couple of years ago. Um, we caught a bilateral gonandromorph rose-breasted grosbeak. So what this is, is a bird that is split down the middle. Um, one side is male, the other side is female. Um, we took a few pictures of this. We put it on our social media pages and it got shared a lot and we ended up giving interviews about this bird. Um, it was really beautiful and interesting bird. Um, I guess this is two years ago now, August 6, 2021. This is our 800,000th banding record. Um, it's a cedar waxwing. Something notable about this bird is that um, 
the tail band on it is orangish, which I know that the photograph isn't the greatest. It's a little bit washed out. But this, um, I guess, aberration in pigment is something that was studied here at powder mill. Um, so what happens is there's that um, honeysuckle that's an invasive species that has little red berries on it. And when the berries are ripe, cedar waxwings are in the nest growing their feathers. The adult birds see the honeysuckle as a great food source and they feed it to the young, even though it's not as nutritious as um, uh, native berries. They, it's, it's plentiful, they feed the young birds. So as those feathers are growing, um, instead of yellow tipped, they're orange tipped. So the, the pigment is incorporated into those growing feathers. So I thought that was really, um, really interesting and really uh, um, apt, I guess, that the, eight, the this big, this banding record had something to do with powder mill specifically. So then um, just a few months ago, we opened our new banding facility. So this is this is the new building that we operate out of. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So over the 60 years, we've um, we've done a lot of um, different publications. So there's peer reviewed publications. There are books. Um, even later literature, like we do a lot of blogs and things like that. Um, we do have a list of all of these on our um, on our website, but one one thing that's that's really great is the a lot of the um, aging and sexing techniques that banders use now were honed here at Powder Mill by um, the banders over several decades. All right, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, this. This is I in the recent past. We don't currently have a bioacoustics program here at Powder Mill, but um, we did in the mid, mid 2000s for several years. Um, so as birds are migrating, they are making these little flight calls, these nocturnal flight calls. And this is how they communicate with each other during um, nocturnal flights. And so to human ears, a lot of these sound exactly the same. It's, um, it's really difficult to separate them. Some people are great at it. Um, most of us aren't. So if we record them, we can visualize them with what they're calling sonograms. And then we know what the species makeup is that flies over these nocturnal microphones. Um, and so we were able to have little recording chambers and um, uh, induce the birds to make these flight calls and then record exactly, you know, this is this species making this call, this is what it looks like and build a library so that we're able to um, have, a, have a better idea of what each flight call looks like when we visualize it. And then we did some analyses where we were looking at what was flying over versus what we were catching at powder mill during the next day's banding session. And then we also had several microphones up um, across the valley and up onto the mountain. And we compared um, what was flying over powder mill versus what was up on the, the ridge that's um, just out here. Okay, so I'll move into powder mill present and talk about what um, what avian research projects we have going on currently. So bird banding, this is really, again, at the core of all of our avian research. Um, this is what our nets look like when we have a cedar waxwing hit. So the MODIS Wildlife Tracking Network is um, something that's really gained a lot of um, steam, I guess, over the last several years. And we're pretty involved with this. So what happens um, if you're not familiar with this tracking technology um, is these transmitters are all transmitting on the same frequency, but they have a different pattern so that as they fly over a receiving tower, which is what these things that look like old TV aerials are, um, if they fly within about 10 kilometers of that, it picks up the, sig the, um, uh, the signal and it can identify which bird or which transmitter is flying over it. 
So with this network of these receiving towers up across you know, a lot of the continent now, um, especially the Northeast and then down into the Southeast, we're getting um, really good coverage. And now even into the Caribbean and South America, Central America. So if a bird is flying and it crosses a, a tower, we know exactly when that happened. And then we can calculate how long it takes for them to fly between the towers. So how long is their migration taking? What, um, what paths are they taking? Are they stopping anywhere? How long are they stopping? Um, where are they going? When do they? When are they going? Um, so when are they? How long are they in their non-breeding habitat? When are they leaving to head back north for the spring? So many questions we can answer with this um, tracking technology. Okay, so we also run this flight tunnel um, here at Powder Mill during spring and fall migrations. And so the, the idea here is that um, birds don't understand what glass is. They don't see it as a physical barrier. They either see a reflection of the habitat and fly into it because they think they're going to some plants or they just see it as open space and they fly through it because they don't see a barrier. And so there are glass manufacturers that are somewhat invested in um, trying to manufacture glass that in some way birds are able to say, you know what, that is a solid object, that is not something to fly through. Um, so they'll send us glass samples and we put them um, at the end of this flight tunnel. So there's a treatment panel and a control panel. And that control panel is just normal glass. And then we have the birds fly down this tunnel towards the glass. There's a net that stops them before it's a couple of feet before they get to the glass. Um, but each flight is recorded so that we know which panel the birds are flying towards. Um, and if they are consistently flying towards the control panel, we know that there's something about that treatment panel that they seem to be avoiding. So if we look at that center um, picture there, on the left, you may be able to see some thick vertical stripes. Um, and that is a pattern that is, um, it's got like a UV pattern in it, so birds can see that, but we can't really. We can almost sort of see it in that photograph. Some of these panels of glasses have um, glass have um, deep like decals or uh, visible patterns, and some of them are have a UV treatment. Okay, so combining MODIS and the the glass research, um, we have been pairing banding stations with bird safe initiatives. So there are volunteers that walk these routes within cities or even sometimes college campuses or, or other areas um, regularly during the migration season. And they'll pick up birds that are dead and they will send them to um, an institution that has a collection, so a museum or a university. But there are birds that are alive and maybe are just stunned and they'll send those birds to wildlife rehabbers. Um, and the question is, this is a traumatic brain injury and is wildlife rehab helping? Are these birds able to be rehabilitated and continue on a normal migration pathway? Or are they unable to continue um, or, or just migrate at all? So when the birds are ready to be released from the rehabber, they'll get a nano tag and then um, a bird from a banding station, a nearby banding station, will also get a nanotag. So a collision rehab bird and a bird that was never a collision bird will be released, and we can compare their flight paths. Um, so it seems like re wildlife rehab is working for a lot of these birds. Um, there are, of course, a few that just have weird flight paths. Um, and there is a cat bird, I think, that went due east and then turned south um, during spring migration. And so the question is, was that bird suffering from a, a brain injury, or did it just give up on the breeding season and decide to head south? Okay. So another thing that we've been working on um, is trying to figure out something more about evening grosbeak movements. So there's been this um, population decline of about 92% since 1970, and that's um, an extremely steep population decline. So we don't really know much about their movements. We know they're an eruptive species. 
I know that they used to be in this area when I was a little kid, and then they just disappeared when I was about five years old. They kind of retreated back north. And sometimes we have these eruption years where we may see them. Um, but we don't really know much about how they're moving, where they're moving, where they're breeding. Um, and then if we are able to understand these things, we can start to develop conservation strategies for them. So we've been putting um, uh, these tags on evening gross beaks to track their movements. All right, so another thing that we learned just from, just from banding data, um, oh, people often say, well, how long do birds live? And it's a really complicated question. So we can say, in general, the smaller the bird, the shorter lived it is, and the bigger birds live longer. Um, we can say, you know, I've seen birds that come back year after year for several years. But on average, how long do birds live is a question that's really difficult to answer. But I thought I'd share with you a couple of um, our celebrity long lived birds here at Powder Mill. So I'm, I'm gonna start with the Cardinal. Um, that was a bird that was banded in 2011. So summer of 2011 as an adult bird. So it either hatched in 2010 or sometime before that. Um, I think the most recent time that we recaptured it was um, 2019. So that bird was at least nine years old, if not older. Um, the common yellow throat in that picture, that was banded in 2012, I'm sorry, 2014, and then recaptured in July of 2022, so just last summer. Um, so that bird was at least eight years old. The red-eyed vireo in the picture with the green fingernails, that bird hatched at least in 2011, if not before, and recaptured in 2019. So um, another bird that was at least eight years old. The Sawa owl, um, that was banded in Cumberland County in October of 2016. Um, as a bird that had hatched in 2015, and we recaptured it this went this fall. Um, so a seven-year-old saw what owl. And some of these birds maybe look like they, they're in rough shape plumage-wise, but the red-eyed vireo is in the middle of a molt. That's a normal molt. They kind of get like messy um, because they're growing in their pin feathers. The cardinal, maybe he was a little bit rumpled. Um, but one of my favorite stories is the chickadee um, at the top there. So this is a bird that is you know what we call a frequent flyer. So if a bird is captured a lot and brought back into the banding station a lot, we'll call it a frequent flyer. And this happens a lot with winter birds because they have high sight fidelity and the same with breeding birds. Well, chickadees don't really go anywhere. Um, there are some that are eruptive, but most of the chickadees around here stay here. This bird, it was a regular capture throughout the year. Um, during the winter seasons, it, it barely moved. It was almost always in the same net or the same trap. And then in the summer, it would move a couple hundred yards um, north and it would be caught in a different set of nets. Um, in, I'm trying to think, it was, I think it was winter of 2021, we realized this bird was um, approaching 100 captures. So we were, um, recording every time we captured that bird. In, it was initially banded in 2016. In 2017, it was caught and it had a head injury. So it had a cut on the back of the head. These are, these are things that we never know if, if a bird will heal for, from that. You know, what did it? Some kind of predator, we assume. Um, and it did heal. And it has this bald patch on the back of its head. It's definitely scar tissue, but it's, feathers never grew back. Um, so we can instantly recognize it when it's in the net. Um, in the summer of 2021 and 2022, we caught this bird with some recent fledglings in the net with it. Um, we also know that it's a male. So we know a lot about this bird's life. We know that it hatched in 2016. We know it's a male. We know that it has really high sight fidelity. Um, and we know that it's successfully reproduced. Okay, so we also do a lot of data analysis here. So one of the really great things about having 60 plus years of data is being able to look back at what things were like six decades ago and compare them to what things are like now. 
Um, so some of the things we know just based on our banding data set is that since the 1960s, um, a lot of birds are arriving earlier now in the spring. They are initiating their breeding activities earlier. Um, there's a shorter period uh, between um, arrival during spring migration or arrival to the breeding grounds and then the initiation of breeding activities. That window is shrinking. Um, and we know that birds have this ability to increase their pace of migration. And by that, I mean, um, birds that are in South America for the winter or Central America, they're cued by day length. That's, that's what tells them it's time to start migrating north. They have no idea what the weather looks like here. They don't know what the leaf out or insect emergence looks like here in North America. So once they arrive to the Gulf Coast and they see that things, you know, phenology, plant and insect phenology has advanced, they're able to increase their pace of migration to try to match um, the, that peak of food availability, so insect emergence. Um, I don't know that they'll be able to keep up that pace if things continue, but um, all of these things are related to climate change, um, warming temperatures. Okay. So just looking at this changes in phenology, these are some papers that were published um, that that first set of graphs, um, that's just talking about spring arrival um, and how it relates to the mean temperature. So birds are arriving earlier during warmer years. Um, the middle set of graphs is showing something that is maybe a little bit more advanced statistics. So it's looking at just a trend line um, for, a, uh, I think it was Tennessee warbler in the fall. And so since the 1960s, we're seeing 1.1 days per decade later fall arrival for that species. But if we apply something that we call the ecological hockey stick model, and it's called that because it looks like a hockey stick shape, we see that things were relatively stable until about the 1980s. And at that point, we're seeing more drastic changes. So these specifically in phenology um, that are related to this warming climate. So if we apply this model since the 1980s, um, these Tennessee warblers are arriving 2.3 days per decade later. So it's a steeper slope. Um, and then the last set of graphs are looking at breeding phenology. So birds are breeding earlier in warmer years. Okay. So some other things that we can look at since the 1960s is we have been able to see that there are changes in morphology. Um, we can actually look at rain shifts, expansions, and contractions. So um, it does seem like we're seeing birds that tend to be further south in the winter. We see more of them in the winters now. And I think we see fewer birds that used to come south in the winter, they're not coming quite as far south anymore. So I'm thinking of things like American tree sparrows. We're not seeing them in numbers like we used to. Um, we can also look at changes in population size using banding data. So I wanted to talk a little bit about changes in morphology specifically. So several years ago, there's a paper that came out looking at um, body size and wing length. So body size is shrinking, wing length seems um, to be getting shorter as well. And scientists are thinking that this has something to do with Bergman's rule and Allen's rule. And so as a reminder, these are ecological principles. Um, Bergman's rule says that similar animals in warmer climates are smaller than similar animals in colder climate. And it has to do with um, uh, the surface area to volume ratio and how birds are able to um, stay warm. And then Allen's rule talks about how birds or and any animals, organisms in warmer, drier climates tend to be longer limbed and slimmer, whereas similar animals in colder climates tend to be more compact, um, shorter, uh, shorter extremities, um, and just like a little bit rounder. Um, and that also has to do with heat conservation or heat dissipation. And so they're saying that with warming climate, um, because things are warmer, maybe body size can just be smaller. So I looked at um, 
pattern mills data set and I compared it to another data set that's um, from a banding station that's about five hours to our northwest. And what I found was um, that the wing lengths of birds here at Powder Mill are almost universally getting shorter since the 60s. But at this other site, they seem to be getting longer, which is completely opposite. Um, so if we look at these graphs here, that center line, that vertical black line, that's showing no change. Anything to the left of it is showing um, decreasing wing lengths. Anything to the right of it is showing increasing wing lengths. And I also looked at um, powder mill just over the last 25 years, and I'm seeing that those changes are more drastic since the early 90s, but overall since the 60s, they are still getting shorter, just overall not as much because it's spread out evenly over 60 years versus just 25 years. Um, this is like a one to 2% change in many of these species, which is significant. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, um, other things that we do here at Powder Mill um, currently is we teach banding workshops to um, often it's students, sometimes um, volunteers or banders from other stations, sometimes they're wildlife professionals, um, anybody who maybe wants to use bird banding as a tool in their avian research. So we do teach a lot of banding workshops here. All right, so what direction are we going to be taking in the future here at Powder Mill? So this is what our new facility looks like. This is, I just took this today. Um, the Richard P. Mellon Avian Research Center has um, expanded facilities for us to be able to um, do more, more research, more education, more collaborations. So inside the lab, we have new research space. Um, so there's a banding lab and there's also a lab lab. So we can do things like centrifuge flood. We can have visiting researchers at their own workstations. Our field techs have their own workstations. Um, so there are side projects that we do or, or have visiting researchers here. Um, we've had people do ectoparasites. So um, looking at ticks and how they might be spreading disease um, between birds. Um, we take hippoboscid flies off of birds so that in that little vial there is a, that's a, a flat fly that gets in between the bird's feathers and it is it's a parasite. Um, we've collected those in the past um, and now just um, if one flies off and we know what species it flew off of and we can grab it we'll collect it for our um, entomologist on site and she's actually found parasites on parasites, and she's very excited about that. Um, we've done blood sampling for various reasons. We do feather sampling. Um, we had a researcher here that was looking at avian malaria um, in selected species. Um, we've done fecal sampling as well. So we just did a project this fall. Um, we collected samples for a master's student who is looking to see if there are microplastics in songbirds. And I'm very excited to see what he um, he comes up with. So these are just a few things that we can do here, but we can have that capacity now to have other visiting researchers and in more in-house um, research as well. So if we go back to just using the banding data, there are so many questions we can answer with just, just those few measurements that we take on every bird. Um, phenology we've been looking at, but there's a lot more questions that we can answer. Um, we can look at habitat use. We can see how birds are moving together or which birds seem to be associating with each other, especially during migration stopover events. Um, we can look at po population dyna dynamics and demography. Those are questions that are always on banders' minds. Um, it, during migration, we can look at refueling performance. We can do some different calculations to figure out how birds are gaining mass during stopover. We can look at migration pathways, you know, anything to do with migration, especially with the, in the tracking technology that we have now. Um, we, can, we have the ca capability to study birds throughout their annual cycle now. Um, we continue to look at molt strategies and figuring out better ways to age and sex birds. Um, the question of longevity is always on our mind. 
And then really all the reason that we do all of these things is conservation. And we also are able to do a lot of education and outreach. And I think that's something that Banders um, maybe pride themselves on a little bit is that our study species are really interesting to the public. They're really charismatic and they're really great ambassadors to develop that passion and the general public for conservation. So we also have this new classroom space, and this is a space, um, it's, it's a separate banding lab that we can use at the same time as their smaller banding lab where we do most of our research, but it has seating for up, up to 25, maybe even a few more people. So we can bring field trips, we can bring college classes, we can bring um, groups of adults, we can have open house days where the public can come see the research and talk to um, anybody who is doing the science and learn more about what we do here. We also really want to expand um, our professional development um, workshops for banders and have new classes. So a few, right before COVID, we, we were able to bring 13 Latin Americans to Powder Mill to learn. Um, it was an avian ornithological, advanced ornithological techniques class. And so we taught them banding, we taught them modus, and then we had guest speakers who did other sorts of avian research come in and um, teach them other techniques. So now they can go back to their home countries. They have a nice solid foundation and they can start teaching their peers as well. Um, and we also have this expanded ability to do outreach now. Um, we've done, public events where we do Sawa owl banding. Um, it was successful, but two years ago we caught owl. This past year we didn't catch any owls, um, but we had other things going on. We had our education staff that helped with some activities and things, and people were really excited about owls. Um, our classroom has a TV where we can do presentations in there. So we um, were able to have groups, we're able to have certification sessions, um, all kinds of things. And uh, one of the things we started to branch out into this past year was doing um, birds and broods events where we had guest speakers come and talk and then local breweries bring beer. Um, we did, we got to have Scott Wyden so I'll talk about his newest book um, this summer, which was really exciting. Okay, so I'm just going to end with this quote um, and talk about how important it is to combine research, education, and conservation. So I talked a little bit about how um, birds can really be that, that spark for people to understand you know, why we need to co conserve not just birds, but their habitats, the ecosystems, and all of the interactions they have with other organisms. So um, if we don't know birds, why would we care about conserving them? So our one of our missions is to teach the public a little bit more about the science and why we do what we do so that they can um, get excited just like we are. All right, so with that, I guess, um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Annie, that was fantastic. Thanks. Um, we do have a few questions uh, okay. already. Uh, first is from Linda. What is the cost to put tracking on one bird? Yeah, so that's a good question. So if we're just talking about the like the nano tags, there are a couple hundred dollars per tag. Um, and then it, there is a cost to main, erecting the towers, the receiving towers and maintaining them. Um, luckily, there are some really great grants that um, these MODIS collaborations are able to get and that helps cover um, the putting up the towers, maintaining the towers, being able to pull the data off of the, um, the computers and then also the tags. So it's not cheap, I guess, is the answer. No, it's not. How long did the tags actually stay with the bird? Yeah, so that's another good question. So the smaller the bird, the smaller the tag has to be because we don't want the tag to be, um, it has to be like a maximum of about 3% of the bird's body weight. So if we think about something small like a, um, American Red Start or Magnolia Warbler, that's like eight grams, like on a good day. So the tags have to be really small, meaning their battery life is a lot shorter. 
So there are tags and, and some of the tags that we're putting on the evening roast beaks, they're a bigger bird, they're heftier, they can carry a bigger tag. Some of those tags actually have solar panels. So presumably they could last several years. Um, so the smaller the tags, it's maybe a few weeks to like a whole migration season, but the bigger tags can last years. Okay. Cool. Uh, Linda had a follow-up question. How is that different from using cell towers to track birds? Yeah, so it's similar. Um, it's just a different, different technology. Uh, Brent asks, how much new research is driven by available staffers' expertise versus research objectives leading to staffing patterns? I'm, I'm going to try to read that because I don't Okay, <laughs> it's, it's a long one. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a really that's a tough question. So we do we have um, several full time staff who, you know, are um, we have our research interests and a lot of so at least one of one of the people on staff is he's really, really into MODIS. And so he's coming up with new projects that um, tie into that. But depending on these projects, we may need to hire seasonal staff to, to help do the field work. Is that, I hope that's answering the question. I think so. Yeah. And, and you have technicians on staff already that, or do researchers bring staff with them? Um, yeah, well, yeah. So I think visiting researchers are like grad students, if they had field techs, they could bring them with them. Okay. Um, but we, so we have seasonal uh, field techs during the spring, summer, and fall. So fall is our busiest season. That's when we have the most um, seasonal staff on hand. Um, we do have somebody dedicated to running the flight tunnel. She's, she comes back every season to do that. So she knows what she's doing. She's good at it. We always wanna hire her back. Um, the banding techs, they may, there may be some turnover. I know the past two falls, we had a pretty similar staff because they were really good the previous year and um, we wanted to bring them back. So yeah. Feel free to ask any more questions in either the Q&A feature or the chat feature. I'll give a few more minutes. Um, there's a, one question about the recording of the webinar. If you came in a little late, it will be posted on the PSO's YouTube channel. So we are recording it. It will be posted to the YouTube channel um, relatively soon, if not tonight, probably tomorrow or the day after. Um, Andy, one question I have. So you talked about the migration as they journey north becoming earlier. And am I clear in saying they get to, they leave the wintering grounds at the normal time frame based on daylight. And when they get to North America, they cross over the Gulf or whatever, that's when they're, real, they're realizing, oh, we better hurry up. And that's what to... it seems like. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Hmm. And, and some species can do it and some can't. Okay. Um. Interesting. All right, where you can some thank yous rolling in. Some compliments for you, Annie. But if there's no more questions, we will wrap up so everyone can continue with their night. Uh, Annie, thank you so much for being willing and, and able to talk to um, all of us and give us a, a you know, peek into powder mill and the research that's going on with these birds. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, no, thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Um, we, we are having more um, public days here during the migration season. So it's all on powder mill's website. Um, there's the powder relating research website and then there's this powder mill's website that's part of the museum. That's the one that has the events on it. Nice. And it's not, I, we usually put them on our Facebook page too, especially with weather's iffy and we have to delay or cancel. Facebook is the way to go with, I hope, you know, I know not everybody has it, but it is a great way to communicate. Do you have time for one more question that just sure. came in? All right, well, this would be our last question. Uh, any research going on about native plant versus non-native plants regarding impact on birds? Not anything here right now, but... It is something that we are interested in. And there was, um, so we were going to have a master's student here doing 
trying to answer a question like that. Um, a little bit more specific than that, um, not broadly, is there an impact, but she had a very specific question about antioxidants. Um, and she was gonna do that in 2020 and she, you know, she couldn't because nobody could do anything in 2020. Um, and then, you know, she she changed her project. She did something different, but I'm I'm hoping that there's another student that can answer or you know, do that project because it it is um, it is a really important question. We do have, I mean, we are just covered in that honeysuckle here. I don't think there's any battling it at this point. There are other plants out here that I think that we can deal with, like barberry and privet. I think we can actually deal with those, but the honeysuckle, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's depressing. <laughs> so, all right. Well, very good. Thank you so much for uh, um, presenting. Thank you to everyone who tuned in, uh, had these great questions, and hopefully uh, you'll join us for our next webinar, which will be in March. We'll have the president of the Pennsylvania Bluebird Society speaking. So if you're interested about having bluebird boxes on your property or monitoring bluebird boxes uh, might be a talk you may wanna join us for. All right, good night everyone and thank you again.